ham, got that. Ah, g'day Trendsetters, Greg here from Fish Plate Films, and I'm just making myself a ham and cheese toasted sandwich. Mmm, yum, yum, yum. Now, had an interesting couple of days on the Birdwood sub. This video was supposed to be done in a few more weeks uh, about DCC block protection and circuit breakers and stuff, but ever heard of the Swiss cheese principle? Those of you in the aviation industry or know people in the aviation industry might refer to or do refer to the Swiss cheese principle quite a bit. What it means is you have a piece of cheese, it's got holes in it, that's a mistake or a shortcut that you make. Here's another one. I'm going to make another shortcut. She'll be right, as we say down here. She'll be right. If you do enough of these, and normally the holes don't line up. So this mistake is okay. Uh, you know, the hole doesn't line up with this one, and you don't have an accident or something like that. But you make enough mistakes, and if the holes line up, trend says, or enough of the holes line up, ooh, you get yourself a stuff up. Or in the aviation industry, possibly a crash any industry really. So I have had a few Swiss cheese slices line up trendsetters because I've been taking shortcuts and rather interestingly, luckily not too expensive, uh, the cost, but let's get into it and um, I'll, we'll discuss uh, short circuit, circuit protection for your layout and overload protection for your layout, a couple of different things. And what I have to do to fix my little issue that I've, that I've created with the old Swiss cheese. So I'll have this and we'll get back up to the layout and um, we'll suss it out. Right, our transcenders are in the layout now and I'm going to show you the parts that made up our cheese sandwich and all the slices that uh, eventually lined up to give us a bit of a tragedy. Well, sort of. And also to uh, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> so, because I haven't really followed the six P's when it comes to wiring my layout transfer, which you should. I've just been taking shortcuts. So, have a look at the events that led up to the uh, all the holes lining up in the old Swiss cheese principle. Right. So, we're using the old iPhone today uh, for some of these shots because this is a a quick video and uh, haven't got time to set up all the fancy camera gear. Now, where are we? As I've been saying for a long time. You need to get circuit protection for your layout. Now, you know our old uh, boxes here have got circuit protection in them, electronic circuit protection. That works very well when you short things out. But of course, you don't want one short shutting the whole layout down. So there's a couple of different ways you can do it. You can do it with electronic circuit breakers and you feed them out to all your power districts. And they're expensive. Down here, our electronic circuit breakers about $40. And I would have, on the bird, would sub probably about 10 power districts at least. So that's four hundred dollars. That's quite a bit of money. Or you can use these things here, the old bulbs. Now, these are a great idea. Uh, and what actually happens? We'll go into this a bit, bit uh, later in more depth in our upcoming video. But basically, if you short the track out, and the current would rather go through the bulb because it's less than the five amps. So you know, electricity is pretty lazy. And it will go through the bulb rather than go through the short. Now the short will still stay on the track, which as we will find out was a problem because of my dodgy wiring, but only the section that is shorted out uh, will have the bulb on. So the rest of the layout will, will uh, run as normal. And of course, this is the NCE system here. We've got six districts you can have, six on this side, and that's on the, uh, the lower booster, and this one's on the upper booster here. Trouble is, uh, all your sections have to come back to these bulbs rather than be remote. Now, there's a couple of good videos on YouTube where guys are actually getting car bulbs and just wiring up a normal car bulb. These bulbs are in series with the block that you're, uh, or the power district, I should say. Not, don't confuse that with signaling blocks. These are power district blocks. And I think it's a better idea to actually go and get some. Now, as much as I love NCE stuff, uh, these screws, these terminals here, are very small, and for big bus wire, you just can't fit it in. That's why I've gone up to, stepped up into uh, another bus up there. And I think it's a, probably a better idea if you just buy some sockets for a normal bayonet cap, uh, 15 or 21 watt um, auto bulb, 
and chuck them in near the power district. That way it gives you an indication also of your what power district shorted out. Well, having all the bulbs back here at the uh, central location uh, really doesn't give you any idea what's happening. So anyway, I decided to finally get off my bum and you know do as I say and started putting circuit protection in. And the trouble is, because I'd wired it so hastily and I've got droppers running everywhere and buses running everywhere and I decided I'd uh, just start with doing my top and bottom, uh, sorry, my two buses A and B here. I don't know, this is confusing if you're looking at it, don't worry about it. But uh, the, the lower section of the layout is, is the main line has two power districts. So I just thought I'd wire them up on a bulb each and uh, I'd be sweet. But because I'd, had, I'd stolen power transsetters from so many buses and so much around the place, uh, we'll give you a bit of a look in a minute, that I, I was gra grabbing power from everywhere and that just didn't work. So, okay, so that's number one. That's uh, number one in the sliced cheeses, uh, or cheese slices, I should say, is that uh, I hadn't wired the layout correctly and I was stealing buses from everywhere. So that's number one. So let's go and have a look at number two cheese slice that lines up. New feeders in. So I've run these new feeders up from here. And look, one of them was like that. There we go. So that's, that's cheese slice number two transsetters, leaving something like that. Right, so I'll put that back there. As you can see, it's still not done, so you know, I haven't learned, have I? Bloody hell. Not soldering connections. Look, just twist them around there, they broke. Now, I know a lot of you use the old, uh, uh, what do you call them, um, knife or, you know, knife connectors that you push a clip on and they, they push the little clip down. And they're big, bulky things. Um, I don't really trust them, but a lot of people use them, and I guess they're okay. The, the other alternative, of course, is, is doing this, which is a lot of work. You know, you have to strip this, and but I just prefer to do this. But, of course, look, you know, this is this is hopeless, how this is loose on here. So that, that was playing havoc with the poor old bulbs, too. I was getting high-resistance joints in all of these, and uh, even just with a couple of locos on the track, the bulbs were, sh were um, shining up, and the layout wasn't working. It was just too much current from all these dodgy connections trendsetters and of course you know all we want to do we just want to get trains running don't we yeah yes we do so i mean i mean look at this you know bloody hell at least this one here is soldered and this is more of what you should do if you if you need a whole lot of connections i know this looking at wiring at someone doing wiring is really confusing so don't pay too much attention uh you know there's there's our bus our a bus coming from our main bus and it goes over there to a whole bunch of terminal strips and then you can get all your positives and negatives off there or your actives and neutrals without taking a whole lot back to the bus. That's what you should be doing, trendsetters. And look, you can see here, Greg's been a good boy, District A, Power District A there. So there you go. And look, I've actually gone through and soldered that one. Bloody hell. So after derailing on our feeder wires, our locos continue along around the layout and eventually come to this turnout. Now the turnout is in reverse at this stage, so the locos derail, and because the polarity is different across the rails, short out, because only the front axle is derailed, and it shorts out on the turnout. Of course our full current starts flowing through those two tiny spots on the wheels, and starts to get hot. Right, what are we up to? Uh, up to slice number five, maybe. Our locos have derailed. Sure, I've got circuit protection on, extra circuit protection, not just the protection from the layout, uh, from the booster. Trouble is, because of all these dodgy connections around the joint, instead of having just one bulb trying to take the short, the whole layout was going through that one piece of track, all the locomotives. There's 25, no, there's nearly 30 locomotives powered on this layout, which is about, about six, 70 milliamps each, so that's about three amps, thereabouts. Uh, two to three amps of power. Just sitting there, doing absolutely nothing. So these poor old locos short this track out over here, and because the bulbs were taking, now this is, 
the issue with these bulbs, which is why we'll do another video on circuit protection. All right, we've got a bit of flare going down there. Uh, which is why the bulbs are not the complete answer, in my opinion. They are great, they are simple, they work, but in a local uh, environment only. I think you need extra protection to stop this exact thing from happening. So, Greg's ha having a coffee with Kevin. It's all very lovely. My poor old loco is sitting here with about three amps going through it, through one axle, because it's only the one, the front axle has shorted this out. Now remember, a train wheel has a minuscule amount of contact between the rail and the wheel. It's, it's, a, it's less than a, a drop of contact. In real life, a real locomotive wheel has about this much contact, depending on the profile of the wheel and how good the rail is. But a real locomotive has, you say in America, a dime's worth or a quarter's worth of wheel touching the rail. That's about it. That's why they get so much traction. It's, it's the purely the amount of weight in that small amount of service. Now, of course, the rail and the wheel deforms a little bit and squashes and stretches, so you, you know, get about that much. But in a model environment, there's no stretching or no squashing. So you're talking about a minuscule, like a dot, a tiny dot of contact area between the rail and the wheel. So we're trying to get three amps through that. Now, because the bulbs were taking the short trendsetters and not the booster, if that had happened and I had no bulbs on there just relying on the old booster and the NCE Power Pro there, it would have shut down. It would have tried to reset, dead shot would have shut down. So it would have, would have gone on, off, on, off, on, off, I come up and I would have come back up here, heard clicking, tick, 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 and everything would have been fine because the short wouldn't have had a time. It would have been milliseconds, shut down, milliseconds, shut down, and it just would have, but no. Because we had the bulbs, and the bulbs were taking all the current, the whole layout's current was going through that one axle on that locomotive, and those tiny, tiny little contact areas, which couldn't handle the current, so it started getting hot. Now, how long was Greg having a coffee for? 10 minutes, 15 minutes? Oh, no, 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 it was longer than that, Trinsetters. <clears throat> About an hour and a half. That poor locomotive sat there for an hour and a half, feeding, there was about two or three bulbs going in there because there was that much current going through because of my dodgy wiring. By the time we come back, I was having a coffee and I said to Kev, I'm sure I left the loco running up there. And he said, no, it was dead quiet when I went up there. Oh, all right, we we'll better go and have a look just in case. Come back, yes, it was dead quiet, all right. Over here in this corner with the new bulbs, there was like a fire going with all the bulbs running. It looked like a fire anyway. Went over to the locomotive and I burnt my fingers picking the front truck up. The wheels were that hot and they had actually melted the brass pickups and bearings where the wheels sit. And we'll go and have a look at that in a minute. And destroyed the truck. Uh, it would still run, but it wouldn't stay on the track. The truck was deformed because the, the brass metal was... So finally, all our little cheese slices trendsetters have lined up and we have an accident. Or in the airline industry you have unfortunately a fatality. Happens in railway stuff too. All the advances in rail signalling have been due to accidents, unfortunately. Uh, which is why rail travel now is incredibly safe. Because of, we've had too many accidents. But that's human error, I guess. So, our slices have lined up. We've uh, had an incident and I've ruined a truck. Uh, which I have stolen off another locomotive to get the old, this one going again. So I think a truck's about $30 or something. So it's cost me $30, uh, which will be more by the time I ship it out here. So let's go and have a look at the truck, and then we'll uh, summarize this, and uh, I'm gonna give you a quick wrap on what I think we need to do to overcome that problem, uh, and still use the bulbs to have really good circuit protection. Hmm. Right, here we have our poor old truck, and you can see that it's not sitting on the rail real well. See that bit of movement there? It's rocking from side to side. And as soon as it had come to a corner, on an outside corner, it would just derail. If I push this along here, you can see how easily that, that comes off. It's even hard to get it back on the tracks now. This side frame here, this one here is pushed in. And yeah, you can see there that it's a bit warped. So, that was a little bit of expensive lesson to learn. All because our cheese slices lined up, trendsetters. You can see that's quite a bit there. 
That's why our track work has to be really good, you know, because we don't have any suspension or minimal suspension in our trucks. Uh, so, you know, our track work has to be quite good. Right, so let's go and have a look at these bulbs and I'll give you my opinion on what I think and where their limitations are. Yeah, Transcendus, I've even managed to uh, get all my power distribution stuff and boxes off the floor and actually made a shelf and even put some circuit protection in. This is where all the problems started, Transcendus, by having dodgy wiring and not doing things how you should or how I tell you to do them. So let's have a look at these bulbs, these circuit protection bulbs, see how they work and uh, in my opinion see their limitations and where I think they should be better used. Now Transcendus, you know that I'm a big fan of NCE equipment. Uh, my Power Pros have been going for nearly 15 years now, or at least 13 years. Somewhere around there, and I just did an EEPROM upgrade, which I suggest that you do if you've got an old Power Pro, and it's got the old EEPROM in it, i.e. the big chip that's got all the info and brains in it. Uh, that has enabled me now to read indexed CVs on the new Tsunami 2s, and also if you buy a new throttle, like my little 06 cab throttle with the digital readout uh, it wouldn't give you the proper train numbers uh, until I upgraded the chip so that's a relatively easy thing to do and they're about $30 or something and I've, if it's an old power pro you should upgrade the chip anyway I do love NCE I'm not a big fan of these uh, for, for main current protection on a layout, and we'll see that in a minute. Also, NCE put rather small connections. I mean, they only, you know, they'll still do, I've got 1.5 square millimeter wire in there, which I, which I should have looked up, shouldn't I, trendsetters? When I, when I edit this video, I'll put what gauge wire that is, but 1.5, seven strand, we use that for lighting circuits here in houses. It's good for about 15 amps. So we're only putting five through it, so that's fine. That's as big as you can get in there. So really, you want to keep this, uh, the, if you're going to use these, you keep this small wire, as small run as you can back to your power pro. Well, this is a zip over here. And we'll see that it's very close to the power pro or command station. So there we go. So it's, it's running, running from here and just over here. So it's not going very far and I'm going to tidy this up again and get it even closer. Uh, but I really wanted to get the circuit protection in because I keep telling, kept telling you all well, you need circuit protection rather than relying just on the electronics in your power pro. So I did it and I screwed up big time because the layout wasn't wired correctly. You really have to make sure all your blocks are only fed from the fuse or the circuit breaker and not going all over the place like mine were. Now, the other issue is, these bulbs here, what happens is, uh, if you want some more information, we might do a more detailed version of this coming up, but there's enough, enough on the internet to tell you what to do with these things. Normally, the current flows through the bulbs, and when you look at how thin the filament is, you know, you've got five amps, or in this case, these bulbs are good for one amp. Now, actually, they're less than one amp because they're a 10 watt bulb, and, or it might be a 12 watt, and NCE say they're good for one amp, but I can tell you they're not good for one amp because we will prove that in a minute. They actually uh, will start glowing at less than one amp. Normally the current goes through the bulbs. When you short the track out, electricity being lazy as it is, it's very lazy, Trent it's a bit like me, the electricity will find the path of least resistance. So instead of the current going through the track because it's short circuit, it goes through the bulb, through the neutral, and back. Even though it's going through the bulb, I know it's a bit, you know, black magic sort of stuff. But the current will be taken up with the bulb rather than the track, and the bulbs will glow. Now, 12 watts, if these are, using Ohm's law, does not give you one amp at 15 volts, which is what we run through our track. It's about 700 milliamps. Now, a locomotive sitting there with its decoder on, not running, no sound, draws about 50 to 60 milliamps. Uh, in the Birdwood Sub, West Birdwood Sub Yard at the moment, I have 15 locomotives sitting there, all switched off. You can hear the layout, there's no noise. Everything's, the layout is on, but there's no sound. Now, with the magic of television, Trent said, what NCE say to do 
if one bulb isn't enough, you can parallel them up. So you can have your one feed coming in as a common feed for all of these from your, uh, from down here in your uh, command station. Each one of these goes to a separate power district, not a block, a separate power district. If you find that the one amp isn't enough, and in this case they're not really one amp, they're about 700 milliamps, you can run two. Now you can see here, a little bit dodgy wiring here, this one here, this brown, goes up to this terminal here. There's also another brown here. It goes up to the same terminal. So I'm using this one and this one, these two bulbs here, to power my yard because of all the locomotives that are sitting in there. Now, we'll turn this light off and we will show you what happens, train setters, as I move in front of the camera, we're going to turn that off. Now, I'm going to remove one of those bulbs. So now West Birdwood Yard is only running on one bulb. Now, watch the magic of television transmitters. It's not going to do it, is it? Of course it's not. Oh, here we go. Hang on a minute. We'll zoom in. There we go, you see that? Now, that there is one, one bulb starting to glow because it's reaching the limit of its current. Now, we'll put an amp meter on that and we'll show you how many amps is actually being drawn by that circuit. Now, I'm going to put the other bulb in. There we go, it's gone away. So now both of those bulbs, I'll just get some light back here now. Both of those bulbs are now carrying the current, this one and this one before I removed this one and the current was all going through this one and it started to light up. So we'll get an amp meter and we'll see what this is actually drawing on that one. Right, we've got our both bulbs removed for our yard and I'm just going to use the amp meter as in series and we're going to see what it's drawing. Now this isn't very accurate. I'm having issues with this amp meter, with this uh, multimeter. So it's not going to be the most accurate, but when we liven it up here, nothing happens. Ah, hang on a minute. Ah, ah got to connect to the other end, trendsetters. There we go. Now, just heard all the decoders turn on. Now, that's on milliamps, and you can see it's showing its overload. So it's over a thousand milliamps. So it's more than an amp. So we go to we go to amps and it's showing 1.83. Now I know that's not correct. There's no way that's far too much for I think there's 10 locomotives up there. 10 or no, there's about 15. 15. So it should be about 1.2 thereabouts, maybe 1.3 amps. Certainly not 1.8. Uh, but uh, DCC is interesting to deal with because you have these frequencies running up and down the track and going through the meter. So this is quite an old multimeter and I'm thinking that the all the frequencies and all the commands going up and down to the uh, decoders because they're always searching, there's always commands going backwards and forwards all the time. The fre there's the frequencies running up and down the track. So I have a feeling that this isn't a true RMS multimeter. So the frequencies might be playing havoc with the readings there, but uh, anyway, you can see that it's it's definitely over an amp, and so if we put the bulbs back in, if we put one bulb back in, I can tell you now, you won't see it with all the lights on, but that's starting to glow there. Yeah, you might even actually see it a little bit. There we go. Can you see it? You can see the filament in there. Look at that. And we put another one in, so we're paralleling the two loads here, and you can see that that bulb is going out now. So both of those bulbs are taking taking the load of the yard. Uh, now the other thing is too, because they're so far away, with this system, you have to have this near your command center, because that's where your feeds come in. And so you have to bring all your blocks back to here, which I think, you know, you're relying uh, there's a lot more voltage drop, even with bigger cables. 
and of course you're running all your five amps or all your you know however many amps per circuit through a tiny little filament there and you know here we are all going about use the biggest wire you can and these are these tiny little like hair type and they're only an inch long but they're still uh, have to carry all that current so my opinion is as much as I love NCE stuff uh, and where these are a good idea I would probably put these out on the layout somewhere let's say you had an industrial area or you had a few power districts that were close you'd put one of these out on the layout somewhere and you would run a circuit breaker you would have a couple of main electronic circuit breakers back here now Trent says why well, I think these are a good idea to be out further in the field I'll show you what happens when we short the track out if I can do it remotely up here somewhere now see that there now I've got the main lines also paralleled you can see those two lamps coming on I've got the uh, both of the up are the power districts on the main line also with two bulbs because having just the one running a, a train with three or four locos on it right up the other end of the layer was uh, drawing too much current, was starting to draw too much current and light these bulbs up even though we're only drawing probably 200 milliamps, 300 milliamps it was enough when you consider all the voltage drop and they've got to go through this little wire here it was enough to uh, start the bulbs lighting up of course when you the bulbs start lighting up it's more current and blah 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 also another thing is when you short it out like that oh, do that again I can reach up and put a screwdriver across the tracks here which is what my locos were doing when they shorted out the old trucks um, now there's probably about two amps or thereabouts going through this screwdriver now and that's what was happening while I was upstairs having a cup of coffee with Kevin Big Kev He's not big, but big Kev. It's an old Australian thing. Anyway, <laughs> that was going through my poor old trucks. And as we mentioned before, the tiny little contact area with the wheels on the rails, which had melted them and blah, 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 blah. Now, if we had one of these, these, or which I think is a better idea, as much as I love NCE, I'm really not sold on these things. The old auto bulbs in a auto bulb socket, and you get an 18 watt one or even a 20 watt one, and that'll give you one, one and a half amps, and a little bit more. You put those bulbs in series, and there's videos on YouTube how to do it, right out on the layout, right next to the block. And then you bring a big bus back to where your command station, and you might bring, say, two or three big buses back, and you put an electronic circuit breaker on those buses. And that way, if you get a short that's over, say two or three of those bulbs and it gets to say three amps or whatever the electronic circuit breaker can go if you have it set for two or three amps will go okay there's more than one short on the layout where we've got a multiple things going there's a bit of a cluster thing going on and I'll shut the layout down and it will shut the layout down and turn the power off and then it will try and reset if the fault is still there it'll shut it down in an instant so I have been away trendsetters done the same thing Walked away and a, and a uh, loco has run across a point, hasn't derailed, I've just run through a turnout. And uh, I've come back in the shed and the power pro is going tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, trying to turn on. And because the current's only been there for a millisecond, there's been no heating, there's been no, there's been no problems. So uh, there is, I think there's room to have both. The, the, your local bulb protection with these, you can do it for a couple of bucks. Uh, you know, just go and buy a bulb, and it's, some people just solder the bulb straight in, but I would prefer to use a socket, a big auto bulb. Also, the thing with this is, if you have this here, and you're down the other end, and you run through, or you have a short, you have no idea what's going on, because the, these are up the other end somewhere. But if you have bulbs around the layout, uh, and maybe you have a little hole that they, you can see them or whatever, they'll light up, and you'll know if you're in that area, that local area where you've caused a short, you'll see it, because the bulb will come on, and you'll go, what's going on? With this one, you have no idea. So in my opinion, trendsetters, the optimum is to have both. You have either one of these out locally, so they're very close to the track, or very close to the tracks you're trying to protect, and then you bring some main buses back. You might have, say, two or three of these around the layout. 
Uh, but I'm probably leaning towards having a bulb for every power district that you want. Like every yard should have, say, one or two bulbs, split the yard in half. Every industry should have its own power district because you know you're going to run through a turnout in industry. It's just going to happen. You don't want to shut the whole layout down. So have low bulbs locally, and then when you come back, you bring the buses back, and you have, say, four, maybe I'm going to have four, two electronic circuit breakers for the uh, top section, top booster, and two for the bottom booster. Those electronic circuit breakers will protect you for big shorts, and they will shut down and shut the layout off. That's, I think that's the best way to do it. You could use electronic circuit breakers for every one, but you're looking at $40 a, a breaker down here. Uh, so I, I think, and also don't run your layout when you're not there. That's really silly. But anyway, that's, that's my opinion. Of course, I've had to double up nearly every one of my sections here because they're just too far away. And that's using uh, big uh, 13 gauge, I think, 2.5 square more for the buses. So, And we were getting, just through the bulbs, we were getting horrible voltage drop to the rail, down to about 11 volts. Uh, and as soon as I parallel them up, it's straight back up to 15 again. Because you're going through these tiny little filaments. You can replace the bulbs with bigger bulbs, which I think I might do. Uh, I'll go and get 18 watt auto bulbs. And they've actually made them, the cutouts in the back here, they've actually made them bigger so you can put bigger bulbs in. So I think I'll go and try a couple of 18 watt bulbs um, in that case. So something to think about of what circuit protection, but you should have it. Unless you do it wrong like I did. <laughs> Well, Transcendence, there you go. That's a brief overview. Well, actually not so brief. I never do things brief, do I? Never mind. <laughs> that's, that's an overview on circuit protection, which you really need for your layout, and also what can happen when you take shortcuts. The old Swiss cheese principles, Transcendence, that's right. So, I hope that was informative, and you learned something, like I certainly did. Don't be dodgy when you're wiring your layout, Transcendence. Don't rush things. Uh, I've had to redo nearly all of my feeders because they were, some were going from this bus, some were going from that bus, and the poor old bulbs were trying to feed one bulb. When I first connected it, one bulb was trying to feed nearly the whole layer. Uh, so it was, it was like a Christmas tree. I couldn't, well, I thought something was a short. It wasn't a short, it was just the, the overload of the whole layer. It was too much for it. So I think a combination of circuit breakers and bulbs is the way to go. And that's what I'll be doing in the near future. But I think with those bulbs, get the, either put that board locally or just put the bulbs locally for overload protection. Let's call it overload protection and not short circuit protection. Uh, dead short circuit protection, I think the electronic circuit breakers are quicker and a safer bet, so a combination of both. Anyway, the, uh, that locomotive was my, one of the two Kato's with the new Tsunami 2. It's very nice. Headlight wasn't going because it's in a consist and it's not the lead locomotive or it's a mid locomotive. So I just tacked it on there. It's actually a mid loco, so I can't control the headlight. Uh, but I put the number board and, and ditch lights on. I could do that, but the headlight won't work because it's directional. The locomotive's actually in reverse uh, when I put it in the concert, so the headlight won't come on. So there you go. Anyway, uh, they're very nice. The, the, the Tsunami 2s, yeah, very good, very good. Well, one, both of them in the concert in a, a uh, future video coming up. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for watching, and hoo, bye-bye.